Uh, and this is a pocket, and we'll look at these here in a minute. I do use a unique symbol for these. Um, I've actually turned part of it off. Now, the reason I do this is because this door affects plumbing, affects electrical, affects how you're going to attach the exterior cladding on it. These doors, a lot of people forget, here's my slab opening, but if it's going to slide into the wall, it's got to go somewhere. I can't have a plumbing pipe, I can't run wiring, I can't have switches, and you know, I'm trying to do it. So if I come in here, I cannot put an electrical switch on this wall. Do you switch to a six inch stud? No, they make them, they make them to fit all wall cavities. Uh, yeah, you just buy the frame for whatever wall you're going in. Okay, so, so the, the light switch on here has got to go over here. Yeah. So I guess my master is you don't have to switch a oh, yeah. two by six stud wall there to have you, room. You don't have to, no. Okay. So this is a door that I do use a unique symbol for because it does affect other things. All right, that's just kind of, that's showing you how they go on the drawing. Okay. Let's go to your text and let's look at the different types. They, the author goes into doors first. Now we've covered a little bit of this, so if you would go to start on page 359. Okay, so this is really kind of showing you where to put them. The best use of space for a door is to put it next to a wall. You cannot always keep it three inches off the wall. Okay. And that reason for that is they need it for the framing. Now, um, let's see, did I write down the page number that they show you this? No, I didn't. I can probably find it on Google much quicker. Let me show you why you have to have, well, let's see. Hold on a sec. Let me get you a picture here. see a, oh, we can't see anything. <laughs> just, just Google window frame or door frame and you'll find this. Now, I've got a picture of it where here we've got a door coming in. Windows are kind of done the same way. The reason we've got to get three inches off is these two studs right here. Um, now remember, these are inch and a half thick, right? They're two by four, two by six, two by eight, whatever the case might be. So this is an inch and a half. I've got to have two of them for the framing. The first one right here is called the king stud. That one goes from the top plate to the bottom plate. So it's, it's keeping that thing from moving side to side, right? Because it'll have nails in the end. The other one right here is called a cripple or a trimmer, whatever you framing crews you work on. This one is underneath the header that's spanning that distance across it. So it's holding up this beam. And you need those two studs. That's why you always give three inches from the wall to place a window or a door. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what that is really trying to tell you on figure 16, 13. Here they give you an example of the seal. These are exterior doors. You can kind of see the one that's pushed out a little bit like we just talked about. If you look down below, they do an interior door. Again, the best utilization of space is stick it next to the wall so this door swing isn't ruining space back here because you don't need it to get past full open most of the time. Again, you're three inches off of where this wall comes in. Okay, that's the best utilization of space. Now, do you want it, if, does the door need to be centered in the wall cavity? That's a bad utilization of space, but it might be the aesthetic way you want to do it because it looks better if it's centered. Do what you need to do. But the best utilization of space, like this picture shows you, is put it here. Now, you're, this doesn't affect us, but that knob's probably, how many of you lived in houses where that knob knocked a hole in that wall? Okay. That is not our problem. 
as drafters. Hey, that's the owner keeping maintenance and putting door stops and these types of things in there, which we all know a lot yeah. and do things like that. Um, they do show the pocket door representation. Now, I think they, you know, they don't really give us a good picture. A pocket door, which is in figure 1615. When you can't get door swing, this is the one to get. Real quickly, if you're at your computer, Google floor or pocket door frames. How do you fix those after they're put in? Yeah, rip out the whole all the sheet rocking. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> Depends on what you're trying to fix on it. I'll call you, out. Andy. Andy, come fix my door. They have little cam locks. Do they? You take the door loose and take it off. Um. All right, I'm going to just pop into this figure right here. So again, this is just the big thing to remember on these guys. So the door slides in and out of this frame. This is the one you're walking through right here. This is what's covered up with drywall. And, and again, that frame needs to go in there. That's why we can't put anything in that wall cavity. So keep in mind, with pocket doors, you not only need the this, but you can't bend this wall either. Okay, so I can't take it, if I'm doing a because a lot of people like these in bathrooms, but let's say I have a wall that looks like this. And then I go straight. And I want to put a pocket door in here where that is 2 6. Can I put a pocket door in this cavity? No, because I don't have any room for that frame to sit. Okay, so you have to have double the room of the door or better to fit the frame. It's got to go in a straight wall. Okay. So, in this situation, that's got to be a swinging door. So if you wanted to make a picture from the wall, had the pocket door, if you found the wooden part, would you be able to do that? Can you say that again, sure? Mm -hmm. So just if you have the wall where the pocket door goes in, and I've, I've got several and I'm just never hanging anything where it slides. You can still hit a stud. So if you find those studs, you'd be okay. Please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't put your hangers, because a lot of people screw those in. Uh -huh. Your screw can't go back into that area. You just can't have anything to impact that slab going in and out. I've always put a piece of OSB over it before I put the drywall over it. Oh, I like it that you, idea. It gives you enough space. You fur the wall out with OSB and then you put drywall over it and then you can still use standard screw sizes and stuff and just go straight into the wall everywhere. Wow. Not a bad idea. Go now, ahead. Gonna, you to, if you're doing something like that, you got you might have to carry the OSB so you don't have a the wall bump out or whatever, but I'm sure that's being taken care of too. Alright, so pocket doors. Good doors where door swing is a problem. Um, before we leave this page, let me just throw one other comment on the symbol. This door symbol right here is the bane of my existence. I, I hate these things. It doesn't go far. They cause a lot of problems. They kind of look more architecturally pleasing, where you draw the frame at like 45 degrees. People that do that, I've seen them put them in bathrooms. And they don't see the full opening distance, and so they'll stick vanities and stuff that come down into about right here. Okay? And usually the doors are one of the last things to go in. The cabinets are going in first. So they'll put the cabinet in here, and you put the door on, and now you can't open the door. If you use a full opening symbol, that will never happen to you, because you'll see it. So can you do it either way? You can do it this way. As a beginning drafter or a beginning designer, I recommend you don't. Okay. Now, once you got experience and you're, you're an on-the-ball person, you've done a lot of this, you know what to look for, sure, do something that's architecturally pleasing. Make your drawing stand out a little bit. This looks better than that standard that you see everywhere. It looks better. Okay? And, and architectural drawings are works of art. Art is very important to the drawing set. 
for now, until you get a little further in your careers, I would recommend you go 90 degrees. Anything else? All right, next page, 360. So if you got bipole doors, let's, let's deal with that one first, figure 16, 17. Bipole doors. Typically, you show these in the open position. Okay. Well, I think we've all seen bipoles, right? They're ones that they just kind of run on a hinge on the top that they open in and out. Mm -hmm. Again, I would show these in the open position, at least half open. Now, the reason is because you might have a walkthrough. We see a lot of these in hallways, right? Where you walk down the hallway, you have a bifold, and there's a washer dryer behind it, these types of things. They're nice doors because they don't have the big door swing. They can cover big distances, but draw them true size, please. I mean, if this is a four foot opening right here, okay, so let's say that's four foot, then what do these have to be? One. One foot each. They're one foot each. So when I draw this, I'm gonna draw this one foot at 45 degrees. And then this one's gonna be one foot at 45 degrees. And the other side is going to be one foot and one foot. This symbol right here where they're not drawn true size, you, again, you're going to probably see mistakes. So please draw them true size, where these lines represent the slabs that open. Because you can get these for all different sizes, right? I can, I can buy that for a two foot opening and have one that just comes one way. I can buy it for a four foot opening, goes both ways, five foot, six foot, whatever the case might be. I can just run down to Home Depot and buy them off the shelf. Yes? So there's the ones that are like, I call them the accordion doors. They like do, mm -hmm. but they open one way, but they only go like two inches. Accordion doors are a totally different thing. Okay. Um, and again, I would draw them true size as a true width and I would show the edge being just kind of jagged because those don't change shape, right? They just slide into the wall yeah. or against the wall. Most times they don't slide into it. Um, really not a door you're gonna see a lot of in the residential market. You're gonna see a lot of it in the commercial market. Like, I think every gym has in America probably has an accordion door. Churches have accordion doors where they're trying to break up spaces, right? Yeah. Uh, temporary walls. Um, Although, we're getting away from those too because they cause so many problems, right? Like, if you look at the CSI gym or Canyon Ridge is a fairly new school, they've gotten rid of all the accordions. What do they do now? The big net. Yeah, the yeah, big, big net that drops down to divide those spaces up for multi-use. What about barn doors? Um, barn doors are a fairly recent thing for the interiors. If you're going to do a barn door, it's a slider. Yeah. Okay? But I would draw it where I'm putting it probably in the half open position. So it would look something like this. Because it goes outside, right? Yeah. And then there's a rail At the that top. goes on the top. So I would probably draw it something like that where it's half open. Um, they don't have an example of this in here, but it is a specialty door. I would look it up on the internet and I'd develop a symbol for it and I would use that same symbol throughout my drawing set regardless of the size and then I would go to the schedule for the sizes. Some of you are familiar with it. Um, how are those things done? We got, we got one hook there, one hook there, and probably another hook here, right? And then they run on a rail? Yeah. And then maybe, you now you're going to have to determine the symbol that you want to use. Maybe I use that symbol. Okay. But, but make a symbol that works. You want to get as close to how it looks so people recognize it, but it doesn't have to be exact. Would they be in a door schedule or would they just be oh, left yeah. as openings? They're a door. They're a door. Okay, so. Um, we've got closet doors, down on the bottom of page 360, pictorial doors. What do we call these types of doors right here? French door. 
Typically, we call them French doors. Now, keep in mind, most French doors have a solid glass on one side and one frame that opens. Some of them are double opening. If I use a double opening, I should have two swings. If I've got a single, just one. But it is all bought generally as one unit. Okay, so you'll plan for like a five foot or a six foot space and you'll call it out. French door, one door. And then they'll go down and buy it and the framers will have the whole for it. You do want to watch when you're doing your symbols for doors like on six, figure 1620. I've always wanted one of these doors. <laughs> I'm going to put this in my house. <laughs> if it's a single swinger, it's probably hinged on one side of the wall. So you would want to put the symbol up here on the edge. If it's a double swinger like this one, then it's probably hinged in the middle of the door, or the wall cavity, excuse me. So you want to kind of show those because that will affect where it's going to swing, right? If it's hinged in here, you can't get past 90 degrees unless you break the frame. This one could, if it was hinged up here in the end, it could swing all the way back. So you just kind of want to watch that as you look at these and show them correctly. Yes? So it's only showing a half door, but that's what you would use for like a kitchen door that you wanted to swing. Yes, all yeah, the way swinging to kitchen door. Because that's a, this is a kind of a, a full door that's a swinger. is real popular between a kitchen and a dining room, right? Especially a formal dining room where they'll swing both ways, so you've got an armload of dishes or meals and you don't have to open it. You just put your shoulder against it and push through it. What's that? Are they a custom door or standard? Can you go Home Depot and buy a swing door? Uh-huh. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, you might even get into doors like here. These are, again, not common doors, but here's the old one we Think of like in horse barns. I like have that. indoors. <laughs> Inside uh, your house? Does anybody have these in their house? I do. In the laundry room, one in the kitchen. And any uh, I did in our bathroom so we could open the top and make the bottom close. Yeah, open Is it just because you have kids? A lot of times in churches too, right? Pain care centers and stuff, so we can oh. keep the bottom shut and keep so the going little out, so rug rats aren't <laughs> taken off on us. The horse is out, put the heads in. Whatever the case. So again, notice the symbol on it. So in essence, oh, we well got, got one more door. Garage doors. When you do a garage door, we generally show it in the open position. So in essence, and we'll do cover this when we get to garage doors, you're going to have one line out here because it has a big header on it, and we'll call out the header. Now a lot of people will use just an OBJ line and lay it right on it. Some people will switch to a center line or a phantom line to show that header. When we draw the door, we use dashed lines. Now what you want to make sure of, garage doors always sit on the inside plane. So if I've got an eight foot high door, I take the inside here, go back eight feet, that gives me this one, and then I just draw those in and connect them. I use an X frame with hidden lines, and that's just telling people, don't put a light up here. Um, I will need probably an outlet for a garage door opener or whatever the case might be. So it helps the electricians out also. So this is how you display a garage door. Again, make sure that's full distance from the interior wall. Whatever door you have, they can, you can find whatever you need for the particular situation you have. You're going to see a lot of different types like hollow core doors, solid wood doors, solid metal doors. You will have specialty type of doors and we'll take time to go through our structure and let us know. Yes, Amy? If you have a double garage door, how would you do it? Or do you just do something like that for a double garage door? Um, if I have another wall, my wall keeps going, okay, and then I just have another one, that sits here. It doesn't matter how far your space is? Um, no, it doesn't, but it does. Um, we're kind of getting way ahead of ourselves. It, can I stick two of these right next to each other? Maybe if they're small enough, but I have shear wall stuff that I have to deal with that will come down the road. That states shear walls 
I need panels to withstand tipping, and code states I need one every 20 feet. So if I took two 16-foot width doors and put them right next to each other, that's 32 feet. I can't get a shear panel in there. I now have to go pay for an engineer to design this wall for me. And we're trying, we try not to get to those because we're just adding cost. But if we need to, if the client calls for it, and I would recognize that up front and say, you know what, we're going to have to do a engineer review on this drawing set. I can't do it. It's going to cost us 500 bucks. Be ready to pay it. Because I'm not paying it. I'm the director. You're paying us. And then you would turn the drawings over. A structural engineer would look at it, tell you, put this here, put this here, stamp. There you go. Yes. So say on your front entry, I found an example if you need to look at it. So say on your front door you have like the double doors, but you want to add those accent windows that are flushed all the way to the bottom. Side lights, transoms? Yeah. Are those included in your door and window schedule as a frame of the door, or is it excluded? It's part of the door. It's part it of the door. It depends on how they want to do it. So it's up to the client. If they buy a whole unit, you can buy the whole unit. It's part of the door. And so I would show the door at six foot or whatever it is. Uh -huh. I would draw it with a door and two window symbols next to it, and then I would call it out as front door with side lights, and they buy the whole frame. Okay. And if they just want to do it, you can get the same look by not going there, and it's a lot cheaper uh -huh. by just doing the door and some long windows, and windows across the top. It's a lot cheaper than buying those. But, but they'd have to buy those specialty glass windows because they are going to go down yep. below the. Okay. Yep. That's one of the reasons why it's good to do the whole door. Instead of just windows. I've seen them both ways though, so it's um, kind of weird. You can find a door for just about any use you need. It's going to depend on cost and aesthetics. The thing, the thing I want you to just kind of know right now is you have to have some types of doors. So on doors, you have to have one three foot door in the structure. You have to. Typically, people put this as the front door. This is a code issue. One three-foot door. The door that goes between a garage and a house has to be a one-hour fire door. Has to be, which means it's metal. It will have self-closing hinges on it, and it will be insulated to keep a fire break in between there. It'll be insulated usually with something that does not burn. Those are the two main doors you really kind of got to get in the structure. If you got any exterior door coming off a garage, I'd recommend you go metal. It's exposed to the elements. For a list of your interior door sizes and how you should work it, <coughs> I didn't write down the. Did anybody find the list of this? I think it's toward the end of the chapter. On recommendations on where doors go, what sizes. Let's find that list. Uh, it might have been in 10. So, what happens if, like, you're a midget or you're a giant? And you're like, your door's. You do have to, though. You have to get it specialized. Because, like, you're. Say your walls are 10 foot and all your door frames have to be 8 foot, or you're a midget and all your walls. Tell you what, are let's take a break um, for a bit. We'll come back and look at some windows. I'm going to find that and take the list number. It's not to take care of what we do. Let's take a break.